hey, good morning, church. Hey, good to see you all this morning. We got a beautiful day out there. We are in the Lord's house, ready to worship, amen? Amen. All right, that was great. Hey, listen, I had a, the the doorbell rang at my house, and so I kind of yelled up to one of my kids, hey, get the door. So uh, my kid went down the door, checked out who was there, and said, nope. I said, what do you mean, no? I said, dad, there's these two nicely groomed young men with white shirts on and, and badges with bicycles. This one's for you, Dad. I said, okay, all right. So I went to the door, and I uh, had a smile on my face, and so did the nicely groomed men. They said, hello, sir. I said, hey, how you guys doing? They said, we'd love to tell you about salvation in Jesus Christ. I smiled and said, okay, shoot. <laughs> so they, uh, they kind of told me their version of the gospel um, and how uh, the founder of their church, a guy named uh, Joseph Smith, had a revelation from God and wrote uh, these revelations down in a book they called the Book of, of Mormon. And I said, all right, that's really interesting, guys. I said, now I tell you what, I've trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, okay? He, he died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins, and he, and he rose from the dead. And they said, you know, that's, that's really good, sir, but we want to share with you a more complete, a greater version of saving faith in Jesus. I said, really? (laughs) I said, guys, let me tell you something. The Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 9, that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I said, now listen, guys. If I have the truth, and if I have assurance of my salvation in Jesus, I don't really need what you're selling. And they kind of looked at each other like, huh? I said, listen, tell you what, I want to invite you guys, why don't you come to my church this Sunday? And they said, well, who's the pastor? I said, I am. Man. They never showed up. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a great Mormon evangelist, I guess, but uh, anyway. You know, it seems that people are always willing to, to sell us um, something beyond just Jesus, right? They'll say, listen, Jesus is good, but you need to make sure you never sin." Or they'll say, Jesus is good, but you you better make sure that your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. Or they'll say, Jesus is is good, but you need to have this sort of experience before you can truly be saved. And i got to tell you, this has been going on for a long, long time. All right? This is nothing new. We're going to start a new series this morning in the book of Colossians. And um, the Colossian church, they, uh, they had people that were trying to, to sell them a different version of salvation in Jesus. It was Jesus plus. And we're trying to say there's nothing greater than Jesus alone. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So it tells us in the book of Colossians, Chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, that Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. See, Paul was that special apostle, missionary to the non-Jewish world. And he wrote a letter to this group of new believers in the city of Colossae. Now, I know there's different ways to pronounce it. Colossae, Colossae. It's Colossae, okay? Colossae. All right? Um, To the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ at Colossae, 
Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now, what's going on here? Well, about, I don't know, 60 AD or so, there was the Ephesian church. And this is in modern day Turkey. And the Ephesian church uh, had believers there. And as a lot of churches, the gospel will spread. And a group of believers made it about 100 miles inland in the country of modern day Turkey, and you can see it on that map up there. <laughs> if you got your glasses on, it's a little tight. Um, Colossae is kind of in the southern western part of the country. By this time, it was not a significant city, so the church was probably pretty small. As a matter of fact, you don't even hear of the Apostle Paul mentioning the church of the Colossians in the book of Acts, where he mentioned all the different churches that he traveled to. So, Paul's writing this letter to them, and he's in prison in Rome. And the reason we even know about the Colossians is because their spiritual leader, their pastor, a guy by the name of Epaphras, came to Rome to seek out Paul to share with him what was going on with this small group of believers in this town of Colossae. And one of the things that he brought up was these false teachers from, from different areas. It was, it was kind of weird, but it concerned the Apostle Paul enough to sit down and write them a letter. And so we have the book of Colossians in our Bibles today. And as Paul starts this letter, he always begins with a prayer and a thanksgiving. And he's thanking the Colossian Christians. He's thanking God for their faith. And that they would, would grow in the will of God. And as I was studying this passage this week, I really feel that there are like five ways that can help us today grow in the will of God for our lives. So we're going to study that in the verses uh, to come this morning. And I hope you enjoy our, our series on Colossians. We just finished Jonah. And by the way, did you hear what happened this last week? Yes. You might have heard, Right? Check it out. On the East Coast, some guy was, was, he had full, you know, snorkel gear, scuba diving gear on. He was lobster fishing. All of a sudden, he feels this bump and everything goes dark. He got scooped up by a humpback whale. <laughs> Serious. Before he knew it, he said, the whale jets up to the surface. And, and he said, the whale just started shaking its head like, I don't want that. And he said, before I knew it, I was spit out and I was hurling through the air. <laughs> the Jonah thing keeps happening, people. <laughs> Tell me that ain't real. Wow. Wow. My gosh. Boy. With that, we're going to pray. <laughs> Let's talk with God. Father in heaven, thanks, Lord, so much. Uh, for your word, the things that we can learn from your word, even things that seem just so unbelievable, Lord. And yet, every time we turn around, it seems like, yeah, that's possible, especially with your power behind it, Lord, because you're sovereign, you're in control, Lord. Uh, you are the, the answer to our salvation through your son, Jesus. There is nothing greater, nothing greater than, than the message of salvation in your son alone. This was a struggle for that first century church in Colossae. Sometimes it can be a struggle for us. Lord, we, we want to be in your will. We want to grow in your will. And so I pray that you would fill and strengthen us this morning as we learn from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right. Well, hey, if you've got your... Uh, your program's there. I'd like you guys to pull out uh, your note sheet if you've got it on uh, the church app on your phones. Let's all get there. Uh, Colossians chapter 1. I want to share with you five ways that we can grow in God's will from this letter in the, in the opening verses. And the first way is to thank God for his work in our church. Now Paul realizes it's God's will that he encourage and, and empower and strengthen and thank God for, for the faith of these new believers. So it tells us in Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 to, to 5a, Paul says, We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love 
you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Did you catch that? Faith, hope, and love. Man, those three go together, right? For a growing relationship in Jesus. Paul is thanking God that, that this group of people in Asia Minor, as it was called back then, received the gospel of Jesus. He's so excited about that. Man, if you haven't trusted Jesus as your Savior, I want to tell you right now, that's God's will for your life. And if you want to trust him as your Savior this morning and allow me to dunk you in that tank, praise God. You just realized the reason for your existence. And that's to be reconnected, reunited with your Creator, your Heavenly Father. Through his son, Jesus Christ. But notice what he says. He says, I thank God for your love for one another. Listen, when there's true faith, there's true love amongst God's people. Amen? Now, I don't know about you, but you know, a lot of us, we, get, we have to deal with bickering everywhere, right? We have bickering in our families. We have bickering with the kids. We have bickering at school. We have bickering on our teams. We have bickering at work. We have bickering at different places. And you know what? We even have bickering in our ministries here at church sometimes. Right? And listen, love must overcome all that stuff. Love's got to overcome all that stuff, people. Man, I think sometimes God is looking down from heaven. And he's saying, okay, here's the Methodists and all all their splinter groups, and here's the Presbyterians and all their splinter groups, and here's the Lutherans and their splinter groups, and here's the Baptists, and Lord have mercy on them. And, you know, so he's just, God is looking down saying, wow, why are my children so divided? I really think God wants unity. Now, I'm not saying that everything goes. I'm not saying that at all. But in our hearts, especially here, and our own church family, that we learn to deal with our differences in love and respect and honor for one another, and that we're known by our love, right? That in Manteca, it's, oh, Calvary. You go to Calvary. That's that church that feeds the community. That's that church that has vibrant worship. That's that church that's committed to teaching God's word. That's that church that loves one another. That's what we need to be known for in town, folks, right? And so we share it, and when people show up, we better live it, right? <laughs> yeah. So Paul thanks God for the faith, hope, and love of the Colossian Christians. Then he goes on in 5b. He says, now of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. Notice he says the word of Truth, underline that word truth, highlight it, circle it. He's trying to combat against some of these false teachers that have been coming into town and giving their version of the gospel that was different than the one that they received in truth when the church was started. Which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing. So Paul is thanking God for the Colossians that they receive the truth of the gospel. What's the gospel? The gospel is the good news about salvation in Jesus Christ. In a nutshell, that's the gospel. All right? By putting our trust in him, our sins are forgiven. We receive God's Holy Spirit to dwell within us. And we have the promise and hope of heaven someday when we die. That's the gospel. And Paul goes on and he's excited that the gospel is, is going out into the whole world and it's bearing fruit and it's increasing. So, so, so man, you want to be in God's will? Thank God for our church. And thank God for the work that he's doing in other churches too. Other churches. You know what I do? When I'm driving around town, I do drive-by prayers. I do. I'll drive by a church, and I'll pray for that church. I'll just do a little drive-by, because you know what? We're all on the same team. We're all on the same team. 
Yesterday, I was waiting for my daughter. She was at a volleyball practice at uh, one of Modesto's biggest churches, uh, Big Valley Church, if you've heard of that. And I was waiting in the parking lot, and it was hot, and I saw this little prayer garden they have over there. So I parked my truck, and I got out, and I sat down in the shade, and I just started praying for Big Valley. Now, why is the pastor of Calvary Community Church praying for Big Valley? They're huge. They have one of the biggest church facilities I've ever seen. They got a big old Christian school, everything. Hey, you know what? Everybody needs prayer. I don't care how big your church is. I don't care how much property you have. Man, you look under the surface, every church needs prayer. And I want that church to reach the unsaved in Modesto. So I pray for them because we're all on the same team. We get to verse 7 and 8, and Paul thanks God for the spiritual leader of the Colossian church. He says in verse 7 and 8, Now just as you learned the gospel and the truth, not from these false teachers, but you learned the truth from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So the Colossians pastor, Epaphras, he travels all the way across the Mediterranean. He makes it to Rome, which must have been a long, dangerous, costly journey. And he finds the apostle Paul, the father kind of, of the faith of many of these Gentiles. And he's telling Paul about these believers, about his ministry in, in Colossae. And Paul is grateful for his ministry, and he's praying for him. People, can I ask you, in your daily prayers, will you keep our church in your prayers? Will you keep our staff in your prayers, please? That's what Paul did. He knew that was God's will. And I believe it's God's will for us that we keep not only our families, not only our problems, not only our challenges, but our church and its ministry in our daily prayers. Can we promise to do that with one another? Can we do that, please? I need your prayers. Lord knows I need your prayers. <laughs> we all do. There's a second way to grow in God's will, and that is to fill ourselves with the knowledge of his will. Now, these false teachers in in Colossae, they were kind of trying to tell these these new believers, maybe they had been Christians four or five years, that, that, okay, you've heard about Jesus and the gospel, that's great. However, you need to discover a higher knowledge to truly connect with God, to truly be saved. You need this extra spiritual insight. It's kind of like Jesus plus. Jesus plus, and today we see folks that'll take their faith in Jesus and they want to add like transcendental meditation techniques or they want to, you know, connect with nature and oneness with uh, the soil and the trees and, and find gurus and have extra mystical experiences and all that stuff, right? And Paul's trying to tell him, you've received the truth from the Paphras, your pastor, and I want you to remain in that Truth. Fill yourself with the knowledge of God's will. And so Paul says in verse 9, And so from the day we heard about your faith, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will, so that he will help you with all your problems, so that he will help you figure out exactly what he wants you to do in every situation. No, it doesn't say that. It says, you may be filled with knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Notice, Paul prays for the knowledge of God's will, not the solution to all of our problems. Do you see that? See, knowledge of God's will begins with understanding God's work, his saving work, through his son, Jesus. To the world at the time of Colossians, that was a new thing. The Jews had their faith in God, but they had missed out on Jesus. Paul was preaching Jesus. Don't miss it. That's where the knowledge of God's will starts. Not adding anything else to it. 
which was starting to creep into the Colossian church. Now, you might ask, okay, pastor, so how do we fill ourselves with the knowledge of God? We'll put that question on the screen. How do we fill ourselves with the knowledge of God? Well, the first way is consistent study of the Bible. Consistent. Don't just crack it open on Sundays, right? Each and every day. That's one of the ways that you fill yourself with God's knowledge. How do I know that? Because this is God's revealed will to us written down in the scriptures, in the Bible. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, all scripture is breathed out by God. Another word is inspired or God breathed. In other words, the words of the Old and New Testament that we have in the Bible are from the very mind and heart and purposes of God. This is how we understand his will for our lives by immersing ourselves in his word each and every day. Because it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man, and I'm going to add, or woman, of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We also need consistent time in prayer. Not just at a mealtime. Dear Lord, thanks for the food, amen. we got to go beyond that, all right? We've got to take some time in conversation with God. That's all prayer is. It's talking with God, right? That's why when we go to pray, in my messages, I'll just simply say, let's talk with God, because that's what prayer is. So many times we get intimidated. Well, I don't know what to say. What if I don't use the right language when I pray? I get confused with those these and vows and heareth and cometh. You don't have to use all that stuff, right? Prayer is just talking with God. And then finally, how do we fill ourselves with the knowledge of God's will? Consistent surrender to the Holy Spirit. See, when we trust Jesus as our Savior, the Bible tells us that God's Holy Spirit indwells us, fills us, so that we might be able to live our lives pleasing to Him. We've got that Holy Spirit power within us. Problem is, God's also given us a free will, and we have a sin nature, and we tend to want to battle what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. So that's why each and every day we need to surrender our wills. To will of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Number three, to grow in God's will, we need to walk in deeds that bear fruit. Walk in deeds that bear fruit. Now, you ever known people who have a lot of talk, but they don't back it up? A lot of show, but no go, right? They're just talkers. I remember uh, when I was younger in ministry, and, um, and uh, I was on a large youth staff, and we were going we to go on a youth staff retreat. And my boss, he, we, he said he was going to take us golfing. And he was smack-talking us all week long how he was going to just destroy us on the golf course. All right? Just destroy us. And, and a couple of me and some of the guys, we were looking at each other like, I've never heard that he golfs. You think he can do this? Well, I don't know. He's a big talker. Well, I would golfed a little bit on the high school JV golf team, so I knew at least the difference between a club and a golf ball. So I thought, we'll see what happens here. So, so we go out there, and big talker gets up there, my boss, right, just woofs at the ball. When we were done, he, he scored about 125, Okay. <laughs> It was amazing. And for those of you that don't know about golf, 125 is really, really bad. Really, really bad. Okay? The guy was all talk, no walk, all, all show, no go. Now, here's what we got to see. Paul doesn't praise the Colossians just because they learn the truth about Jesus from Epaphras, but he praises them because it made a difference in the way they were living their lives and the way that they were treating others. Look what he says in, in verse 10 of Colossians chapter 1. Paul says, I'm praying for you that you'll have the spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk 
Walk your talk, all right, in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Listen, you want to grow in God's will, folks? You can't stop at just Bible knowledge. Bible knowledge is good, but it can't stop there. We've got to apply it. That's walking the talk. All right? That's walking the talk. <laughs> and he says it, that, listen, I pray that you would bear fruit in every good work, right? Healthy trees bear fruit. And that's what Paul is saying. You should be bearing fruit because of your relationship with Jesus in your personal life and in your good works. That means that there should be a difference in your thought life. There should be a difference in your attitudes. There should be a, a difference in, in your words. There should be a difference in, in your relationships, in your marriages. And there should be a difference in your ministries. They should bear fruit. There should be transformation. There should be change. Good things should happen from it. Listen, if you, you have a gift of service, serve and bear fruit. If you have a gift of mercy, go be merciful. Pray with people. Love on people. If you've got to get to teaching, teach. You have a gift of leadership or administration, go do those things and what? Bear fruit. Right? Bear fruit, he says. It's kind of funny. Uh, a while back, I was out mowing my lawn, and one of my neighbors came by, and, and he's walking his dog, and he just kind of walked past. And then he stopped, and he came back, and he put his hand out, and he says, Hey, I'm your neighbor, Jesse. I said, Well... Hey, Jesse, I'm Jim. He said, you know, I was just going to walk right past you, but in church last week, our pastor said we've got to get to know our neighbors. You've got to love your neighbors. So I thought I'd obey my pastor and, and shake your hand. He goes, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a pastor. <laughs> he looked up in heaven. He says, no way, God. <laughs> Walking your talk, man. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 10, for we are his workmanship. Other translations say we are his poetry. We are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works that we would what? Walk in them. Okay, not just talk, but walk and bearing fruit. That's how we grow in God's will. Fourth way to grow in God's will is to rely on God's Power, not our own. Rely on God's power, not our own. Listen, when we're faced with a decision, challenges, crises, it's really easy to just kind of rely on our own knowledge, on our own skills, on our own abilities, on our own money, on our own resources, on our own contacts, on our own experiences, and we forget to, to, to include God in the picture. And when I do that, I know that I'm operating outside of God's will. And when I see others do that, they're also operating outside of God's will. So here's something to remember. We'll put this on the screen. We might know God's will, but we need his divine power to pull it off. Amen? We need his power to pull it off. We're not going to please God if we try to run on our own steam. You know why? Because our power is limited. His is limitless. And Paul says in verse 11 of Colossians, Be strengthened with all power according to God's glorious might. Not yours, God's. And if you do that, you're going to have endurance and patience with God. Joy. That's the result. I don't know about you, but man, when I'm trying to go on my own steam, I can get pretty bad mood. Nobody wants to be around me. <laughs> I know that's hard to believe. But anyway, but when I'm, when I'm trusting God for whatever I'm going through, whatever the challenges are, when I'm relying on his power, his strength, his provision, and not just my own, I can endure. I can persevere no matter what comes at me, and I can do it with joy. And that's what God wants for us. 
You know, uh, before, the, before the pandemic hit, I, was, uh, I had a meeting uh, with, with a couple in our church, and their marriage was, was struggling. It was on the rocks. They were having a really hard time. And we met, we met several times, and then COVID hit, and we weren't meeting. And I hadn't seen them in church for about a year. And I, and I prayed for this couple during that year of, of COVID. I, I'm just thinking, okay, here they are. They're locked up in this house together. They can't go anywhere. Lord, please have mercy on this couple. Please, God, just give them love for each other, patience. Let them endure this time and then strengthen them, Father. That was my prayer. And then, uh, then they show up to church, right? About a year. I hadn't seen them in a year. And they're holding hands. And they're smiling. They say, hey, pastor, good to see you. And I looked at them. I said, you guys are holding hands. And they said, look, we're holding hands. And they were so excited. And they just pointed up to God. 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 God's power. God's strength. Man, if you're married, ever been married, you know you can't do it on your own power or strength, right? Heck no. We need the power of the Lord. You want to be in God's will? Rely on his power, not your own. The Apostle Paul understood that when he went through difficult times. And he says this in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 to 10. Paul said, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. God says, my power is made perfect in your weakness. God's power is made perfect in Pastor Jim's weakness. I really try to live in that. You know, I mean, I'm not trying to put on a show up here. I'm not trying to be anything. I am just myself in my jeans and my van tennis shoes. That's it. Seriously. I'm just trying to give you guys the word of God. I'm just trying to serve this church faithfully. Because it's not about me. It's about God. It's about God. Because when I'm weak, when I come in need and dependence, God is strong in me. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. So he goes on. He says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ May rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, with insults, with hardships and persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's say this. You finish the sentence. When I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, when I am weak, amen. If we can get that right, if we can live into that church, we will be living within God's will. There's a final way to live in God's will, and that's number five, to focus on our inheritance in Christ. Focus on our inheritance in Christ. When my father died, I received my portion of the inheritance, not because I earned it, simply because I was my father's son. In the same way, none of us have earned our salvation, but we are children of the Father. Amen. And because we are children of the Father, he has an inheritance laid up for us. Isn't that good news? Is that something good to think about? That's something to look forward to. Thank you, God, that there's more to our existence than just this life. Someone said it this way. Let me see if I can say it right. If you're a believer, this life is the closest you'll ever get to hell. If you're not a believer, this life is the closest you'll ever get to heaven. Paul said this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. I give thanks to the Father who has qualified you, you Colossian Christians, you, you new believers in the faith, I give thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints 
in life. He's telling them, focus on your inheritance, not all these outside influences, these false teachers, whether it's Jews trying to make you have Jesus plus all the Jewish legalism, or, or, or whether it's um, these, these Gnostics, these people that say, okay, you got Jesus, but you need this, this higher knowledge to truly connect with God. Listen, put all that away. That belonged to the domain of darkness, and you're not a part of that anymore. You're free in Christ, in Christ alone, and you've got an inheritance It's waiting for you. Verse 13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Yeah. (laughs) I've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb as the song goes, right? That word redeemed means that we've been bought back at a price. Cost Jesus his life to buy us back from the domain of darkness, but putting our trust in Jesus' finished work on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins qualifies us for our inheritance. That's a heavenly inheritance. I want to give you one more verse on that in case you're a little bit confused. It's out of Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. The Bible says this, in him, or in Jesus, you also, when you heard the word of truth, notice, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed. That's permanent. When you put your trust in Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins, look what it says, when you believed in him, you were sealed with what? The third person of the Trinity, the promised Holy Spirit, who is our guarantee, guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. You want to live in God's will? Remember Paul's thanks, praise, and prayer for the Colossians. Thank God for his work in our church. Fill yourself with the knowledge of his will through studying scripture, spending time in prayer, surrendering your life to his Holy Spirit. Walk in good deeds that bear fruit. Rely on God's power, not our own, and focus on your inheritance. Don't get distracted by all the things that might come at you. There's so many things in our culture that want to distract us from the true meaning of what it means to live for Jesus. Stay focused on him. I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads, close their eyes, please. Just take a moment between you and God. Reflect on some of these things that have been shared maybe an area where you need to personally grow in God's will for your life. For some of you, it might mean giving your life to Jesus for the very first time to do God's will for your life. If that's you, the Bible says you need to just believe that Jesus is truly God's son. He died on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. By putting your trust in him, your sins are forgiven. You receive his Holy Spirit and the promise of eternal life. If you believe that in your heart and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior before, would you please just put your hand up and put it down so I can see? You've never trusted Jesus before. You'd like the assurance that you are saved, your faith in Jesus for the first time. Amen. Father God, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your work in our lives, that we might do your will through the power of your Holy Spirit. 
In your son Jesus' name, we pray and thank you. Amen.